What's going on everybody? It's Trevor with Class G Heroes. Making another video today over the Air Force's recruitment process to become an officer, more specifically a pilot. Um, today I'm talking about the TBAS test or the test of basic aviation skills. Now, I don't know, I'm pretty sure that it, you have to take the AFOQT first before you can take the TBAS. So if you haven't watched my previous video, go watch that one. It covers the AFOQT, all the different components of that because that is the first part and then you will move on to do the TBAS and you do it at a later date. It's not the same at the same time. Um, so go watch that video first. If you haven't, if, if you're going through this process and you haven't taken the AFOQT yet, I would highly suggest focus on the AF, AFOQT first and then worry about the TBAS after because you know they, they happen in sequence. So make sure you, you rock out on the AFOQT first before you even start to worry about the TBAS. So the TBAS, the test of basic aviation skills. It is basically the Air Force's way to rate your aptitude for flight um, because they can't really look at everybody and have you go do a check ride with a recruiter or something to make sure you can or you know what flight is. Basically, they just kind of judge your aptitude for it. It's a very vague test. It doesn't really go too in-depth. It, it basically judges your um I don't want to say monkey skills, but basically just, you know, your listening, your multitasking, and your hand-eye coordination. So the first test is a directional test, and it's kind of a, you have a UAV. You are from the point of a UAV, which we're trying to be pilots, UAVs. No, let's get them out of here, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, you are given a map. There's a compass rose and it gives you, it always gives you north. The, the map will always be in an orientation where north is always straight up. So just always remember that. You're always fixed in on that. The, there will be a heading that shows this is the way you're going. So it could show you that north is straight up, but your UAV is heading this direction. So you have to know in relative to here's north. So where I'm sitting right now, this is north, west, south east so it's you're from your perspective so don't get confused over that but it'll give you where true north is it'll give you the direction that your uav is heading and then it will give you a building surrounded by four parking lots on each side and your job is you have a headset on and it will give you a cue to identify the north parking lot so or it can be any parking lot. Don't just say it's just the north. It's a bunch of them. You have, I think, uh, 40 of these. Um, and they're just back to back to back. And you answer them as quick as you can. Timeliness matters. The quicker you can answer them correctly, it helps your uh, PIXM score. We'll go over what PIXM is later. But um, so, for instance, let's just say, for instance, and I will put a link in the uh, description over the website that I use that kind of goes over it and there's flashcards you can go through. It's super helpful. Once you get the hang of it, it's, it's great. And so say, here's an example, map, have a compass rose facing North. Let's say your plane is heading North and it asks you to identify the North parking lot. So you're going to look at that grouping of four parking lots surrounding a building and you're going to select the one that's on the top, because if you're coming North to South and you're, uh, trying to identify the north parking lot, that is the one that's on the north side of that complex. It's the highest one up. Like I said, it's kind of hard for me to describe this without showing visual cues, and I don't have any, so I'll give you that uh, website and the flashcards uh, that can better describe that in a way that you can see it rather than me trying to explain it, because it can be kind of confusing. But just remember, that is probably out of the five components of the TBAS, that is the one thing you truly can study for. The other ones, they test you to see what kind of pilot you can be. You can't study for it, and we'll go over the rest of them here in a second. So once you do the UAV or directional test, you will move on to the horizontal tracking, which is rudders. So when you go into MEPS, they will have, they'll take you into a room, and they have a a little desk there it has a joystick on the desk and then it has rudder pedals uh, underneath the desk. So basically you will have a little box looks like this and there's a little bitty plane on the bottom of the screen and it goes back and forth just like this and it 
wants you to using your rudder pedals, your feet, to be able to keep that little box over that airplane and you follow, you track it and test your ability to use your, you know, I guess foot eye coordination as it were to be able to stay on that target and track it as closely as you can. Um, it, for every one of these tests, it'll give you practice. That is the thing to remember. Make sure you read all the instructions. Don't just like, go clicking in, jumping in, be ready. You get practice reps. Um, so same for the UAV, same for the horizontal tracking. You will get a, a probably a 30-second uh, practice. So you just get in there. You kind of get the feel for it. Identify the dead zone. There will be a dead zone in the rudders. Um, they're not perfect, so you just kind of got to work through, deal with it. You know, there's nothing you can do about it. Everybody else who's going through it has dealt with it too. So just seeing how well you adapt, but you have to keep it as close as you can. And then as you're doing good and you keep it over, over it, it'll start to, it'll start to juke you out and kind of like see how close you can still remain to it when it gets harder. And then the test will end and you move on to the next section. The next section is the airplane tracking test with a joystick. So basically it's the same concept. There's a little bitty plane, you have the little box and it's going all the way around the screen. It's going up, down, side to side. Your job is to track that thing with the joystick keep it on it, keep it as close as you can. Same way with the um, horizontal tracking. If, if you are good and in, it senses that you're, you're keeping up with it pretty good, it'll up the difficulty and it'll be bouncing around up and down. Just try and keep it as close to as you can once again. There's a dead spot in the joystick. It caught me off guard at first. You know, I would get back down and it, it kind of lags a little bit and it's just, you, you just have to work through it. It's it's not gonna be perfect. You just have to deal with it and do the best you can, keep it on, on track. Don't, don't get flustered and be like, oh, I'm so off. Just get right back in. If you, if you mess up on it, get right back in, follow it, track it again, keep going. Don't worry about, you know, messing up. You're, nobody's perfect. Nobody's gonna get, keep it on it the whole time. That'd be literally impossible unless it's like a, an aim bot as it were that can keep it, track it on it the whole time. There's no way you keep it on it. So just keep it close. The next part is the airplane tracking test and the horizontal tracking test combined. So you're doing them both at the same time. Now, my suggestion for this would be to follow the airplane tracking with the joystick, follow that with your eyes and use your peripheral vision to follow the rudders on the bottom. So you're kind of, you're following it and you're using, you can glance down every once in a while to make sure you're close, but use your peripherals for the rudder on the bottom and follow the plane up top. And then the last section of the T-Bass is the multitasking test. Once again, I can explain this to you as well as I can, but it would be more beneficial for you to actually see it. So I'm gonna put the link for that website as well. So then you guys can actually like see these things um, and what they look like is me describing it is not gonna really be that beneficial to you. Uh, the, only, the, o the only thing you can really study in this part is the, uh, if you wanna have someone give you a five letter sequence and you memorize it and then read it back off to them. That's pretty much the only thing. So there's a, a memorization there is simple math. So on one side, there will be an arithmetic problem going and you have to just like be doing that in the spare, in your spare time. So you, you're rotating, you're monitoring all four of these little screens. You're doing math, you're listening, you're memorizing. You, there's an engine gauge that shows you in the green and then the meter will go over and it'll get into the yellow and then the red. Once it gets into the red, it'll start ticking points off. So you always wanna make sure you keep it in that green or yellow range. If it's in the green, you're adding points, you're, you're doing good. If it gets in the yellow, it's not counting against you, but it's not giving you points. And if it gets in the red, it'll start counting off. So make sure you don't let it be in the red for very long. The way you uh, reset it is you just click on it with your mouse. You just click on it real quick, resets it to the middle, start gaining points again. And then the one at the bottom right, there is four boxes and it has four no one through four on it. <clears throat> These are channels for a radio. You will have a headset on. You will be listening to air traffic control, a simulated air traffic control. At the beginning of this test, they will give you a uh, call sign or a identify. It's not your call sign, your flight. For me, mine was Tiger 1-2. So it'll be rattling off a bunch of stuff. It'll alternate ear. It'll be in left ear, right ear, both at the same time. There'll be people talking at the same time. And you have to remember to listen for Tiger 1-2 or listen for your uh, identifier. And then it'll give you a instruction like switch to, you know, uh, ground frequency channel one. You just click on channel one. 
and then it'll give you, it'll read off a bunch of stuff. Make sure you're paying attention because it'll say other stuff. It'll say Tiger 2 1. That's not it. You're not Tiger 2 1, you're Tiger 1 2. So make sure you're listening to that very specifically. If it's anything but your call sign, don't even listen to it. That's what I did. I paid attention to all the other things that were going on, and I literally was just listening for Tiger 1 2. Tiger 1 2, follow the instructions, click the channel they want. Um, that is basically the hardest part, in my opinion. That was the hardest part of the T-Bass was just the multitasking because you're doing math. You're memorizing a five-lettered sequence. You're keeping that monitoring your engine gauge, and you're also listening to the radios and switching channels. So once you've taken the T-Bass and the AFOQT, which, like I said, you should take the AFOQT, it should come first, then you do the T-Bass. Then within the next couple days, I think it took mine two days, it spits out your PIXM score. Oh, and another thing. Uh, they, they have a little questionnaire uh, before the T-Bass test, and it'll ask you, um, do you play video games? Do you uh, play flight simulators? Stuff like that. Um, and then also ask you for any previous flying hours that you have. So that helps your PIXM score. Sorry, PIXM score. Didn't uh, tell you what that was. PIXM is your pilot candidate selection method score. So it takes your AFOQT pilot score. It takes how you did on the TBAS. Somehow the algorithm like judges how you did. And it gives you your PIXM score combined with your flight hours. And it spits out a score. That is your uh, PIXM. Now, I've heard several things that the PIXM score, or basically that, like whatever number you get, that's the percentage of chance you have of making it through pilot training, and they only take a certain amount, like lowest is a 60. I, I don't really know. I don't know the accuracy to all that. I don't know if that's just people saying that. I don't know. But all I know is that they take those tests and they couple them with flying hours, and you can increase. The only way to increase your PIXM score after you've taken those tests, besides retaking them, which, like we said before, you can only take the AFOQT twice. I don't know about the TBAS. I don't know how many times you can retake that. I would assume it's probably twice. It's probably you can only do it twice. The only way that you can increase your PIXM score after those two have been completed is flying hours. So I, was, I would highly suggest, you guys, if you get a PIXM score that you don't necessarily, not that you don't like it, but you know you can improve, you can get a couple flight hours and it's going to bump it up. It goes in uh, groups of four, uh, four points for every like 10 hours of flight you get. It'll bump it up four points. And, you know, if you buckle down and got went out and got 20 hours of flight before you're bored, that bumps up your PIXM score eight points. And that's a big help. So I would highly suggest you guys, if you really want to do this and you, you know, go get some flying experience. If you don't have any already, go get some. It can do nothing but help. Another thing that I would say is a lot of people say that to get selected by the Air Force, you have to have your pilot's license. And that is, that's not true. The, the Air Force does not care if you have your pilot's license or not. It is purely looking at your PIXM. You could be someone that got, a, you know, has no flying experience or someone who has an ATP your commercial license and you have 2,000 hours. They don't care about any of that. They're looking at your PIXM score because a lot of the times... The people who have flying experience will get higher PIXM scores just because they have that um, that knowledge of aviation and they have that kind of skill set already. So most of the time, yes, PIXM scores of people that have a lot of hours are going to be higher, um, but they don't necessarily have to be. You can be someone who did really well in the FAPT, did really good on the TBAS, and you don't, and don't have a lot of flight experience. You know, maybe you have like five hours or so and you get a good pilot score. That's perfect because then you can go out and before the board in the next couple months, get 10, 15 hours of flight time and you're bumping it up eight more points. So I would highly suggest you guys get at least some flight experience. Don't stress over, oh, I gotta get my license, I gotta get my license. The Air Force does not base selection on your um, licenses. It purely bases it on your selection score and your overall application packet. So thanks everybody for watching the video. I'm sure as a lot of you guys know who are going through this process, the Air Force canceled their board and they're not taking any pilots for the rest of 2021, um, which came as a bummer, uh, but they'll be back at it. Hopefully early 2022 will be the next board. So for those of you who are just now starting this process, it's perfect for you. You got, you got time. 
Um, I have also begun the process of applying for a naval aviation slot, so a pilot slot for the Navy. Um, and I'm going to do a video over the ASTB, so which is the Navy's version of the aviation selection test battery. Anybody who might be interested in that, um, I will do a video over that. So other than that, thank you for watching the video. If you like it, give it a thumbs up and have a good day. Thank you.